Hello and welcome back to the Air Armoury, I'm JRH and today I'm looking at the Mars 86 air rifle. This air rifle was manufactured by Venus Waffenwerk in Zellemelis in central Germany. Now, Venus Waffenwerk was originally founded in 1844 by renowned German air gun maker Oscar Will, um, although the company had changed their hands by the time this gun was made. I don't have an exact uh, date of manufacture for the Mars 86, but it was going to be around the mid 1930s. Um, and as well as the Oscar Will and Mars air gun brands, Venus Waffenwerk also manufactured Tell air guns. Uh, incidentally though, Zella Mellis, where this gun was made, uh, prior to World War II was home not only to Venus Waffenwerk, but also to both Walther and Amschutz. So it's a town with a really good air gun heritage. Now I will show you this rifle up close and do some shooting with it in a minute, but before that I briefly just want to have a look at the background to this gun, as the history of rifles like this is one of the most interesting things about them. Now the first thing you'll notice about this gun, uh, apart from its small size, which I'll come back to in a minute, is that it looks very military-esque. And the reason for that is that this is a military training air rifle. Or at least it was unofficially. Now some military training air rifles, such as this one here, uh, the CZ VZ-47, were designed specifically for military use. Um, the VZ-47 here uh, was made in one of the Czechoslovakian state arms factories and has military acceptance marks on it. This is officially a military training rifle. The Mars 86, on the other hand, has a slightly more complicated story. This was made for commercial sale and was marketed as a sporting rifle. Now, when we have a closer look in a minute at a number of aspects of this gun, such as the stock, sights, safety, cocking mechanism and ultimate usage, you'll see that the labelling as a sporting rifle was nothing more than a ruse. Uh, this gun definitely had an ulterior purpose. After the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles of 1919 imposed significant restrictions on Germany's arms production and the size of its military, which include military training. Now obviously Germany did begin to rearm itself and expand the size of its armed forces, especially after the Nazi party came to power in 1933. But in doing this, whilst there were some things that were hard to keep secret, such as the reintroduction of conscription in 1935, rearmament was done as covertly as possible, as it was in contravention of the Treaty of Versailles. So Germany was in a position of needing its military eligible citizens used to handling military small arms and to improve their marksmanship skills. So Germany had two options really, which were to risk increasing manufacture of their Mauser service rifles and expanding their military training program which was contravened by the treaty or they could manufacture military style air rifles which had comparatively few restrictions on and sell them on the commercial market as sporting rifles which they were allowed to do. Essentially they did both. Uh, they mainly just chose to flout the treaty, but the point to take from this is that there was a big influx of military-inspired air rifles on the market in Germany in the 1930s, which included, but was not limited to, the Bonner Model 2, the Hainor Model 33, the Diana Military Model 30, and the Mars 115, or 115. Now these predominantly saw use uh, as cadet training rifles with the Hitler Jugend, or the Hitler Youth, which was essentially compulsory Nazi scouts for children aged between 14 and 18. Now those guns are the full size and weight of military rifles, so were unsuitable for the younger children in what was called the Deutsches Jungvolk in der Hitlerjugend, which translates as uh, German youngsters in the Hitler Youth, which was the specific section of the Hitler Youth for uh, boys aged between 10 and 14. So the simple solution was to give them shorter, lighter, less powerful air rifles in that same military style, such as the Hainel Model 33 Junior or the Mars 86. Using these rifles, the youngsters, of which you can see a few in this picture here, would develop their shooting skills and try and earn the coveted Deutsches Jungvolk Marksmanship Badge. 
Now I don't have one of those to show you, but I do have here a reproduction of the Deutsches Jungvolk membership badge. Um, the badge clearly shows the Deutsches Jungvolk's Nazi links with the Sig rune in the middle, which was the predominant symbol adopted by the SS. And the angle of the silver bars are very reminiscent in form of the swastika and even just the colour scheme of the red and black. So that is the background and history to this gun and with that in mind let's take a closer look at the rifle itself. The fact that these were young cadet or essentially children's rifles explains their diminutive size. Uh, the Mars 86 is only 34 inches or 86 centimetres long and it weighs just 3 pounds 10 ounces or 1.64 kilograms. Now it features a full length hardwood stock. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the wood is but it looks probably like it's beech. And whilst it does have the distinctive military style stock, um, as it's just a small cadet training rifle, it doesn't have some of the military style features found on the slightly larger Mars 115, such as the butt plate, uh, barrel bands, or upper wooden handguard. Uh, it does, however, have serrations on the butt to give it some grip when you shoulder the rifle, and also some grooves cut in the fore end uh, to help you get a good finger hold. In terms of additional hardware, it has a steel end cap at the front here, a fake cleaning rod underneath which adds to the military look of the gun and sling swivel, uh, swivels mounted underneath. Uh, a couple of things to point out about the sling swivels, the front or the rear one there and the front one uh, are different but they are original and correct, that's how it's supposed to be and it does also have a third contact point as the front screw for the trigger guard um, that is again uh, original and correct. Um, as you can see this one has a sling fitted, uh, it's a leather one uh, which has been glued at either end as obviously the original uh, buckle or stud whatever fastened it has been lost over time. Uh, I've got no idea really whether that's the original, it's definitely an old sling but yeah, I, I just have no way of knowing whether that's original. Um, the main part of the rifle is essentially made of two cylindrical pieces of steel. Um, this rear one is the compression chamber and this front one is actually a kind of a barrel sleeve rather than the barrel itself and it looks like one just overlaps the other and is then crimped in place. If I open this collar on the top of the barrel sleeve you can see the barrel inside there. Uh, it's an 11 inch or 28 centimetre barrel. Uh, it's hard to see exactly whether it's smooth bore or whether it has just very well worn rifling. I uh, wouldn't like to say for sure. It's not very clear from the limited view you get looking down it and I can't find confirmation in any of my written sources. Now the gun is in 4.4 millimetre which was the only calibre it was made in and it fires lead balls rather than pellets. Now, whilst that may sound like an unusual air rifle calibre by today's standards, it wasn't uncommon for guns made in continental Europe during this time period. And I do actually have a whole video looking at uh, lead balls in air guns, uh, so if you're interested in that, I'll put a link to that in the description below. So to load the gun, you simply open the collar on the barrel sleeve, drop in your ammunition, and then close it back up. And then that space between the barrel and the barrel sleeve uh, acts as a magazine. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many lead balls it takes, I haven't tested it, but I'd say approximately 100, maybe a few more. Um, and then it's just gravity fed via a small hole towards the back of the barrel. And that makes it a repeater uh, in that you don't have to manually uh, load a new pellet or lead ball into the gun before each shot. Um, from what I've experienced though, this is not a good system. Uh, because there's no specific hopper and the lead balls are just loose around the barrel, I found that you have to really shake the gun around to try and get a pellet to drop into the barrel. And because it's all internal, there's no way to confirm that a pellet is actually loaded and ready to fire. Um, it's very hard to tell by just looking down the barrel with a torch. So I've had to have a poke about a bit and it does seem like there's actually two holes to feed into the barrel, uh, one on the top and one on the bottom. Uh, presumably that's to increase the chance of getting a pellet uh, to 
get into the barrel but I found that gravity actually means that that's likely to let it drop back out. Um, as well as these problems I've also found that it's quite easy to get a lead ball um, kind of through the loading port but not fully seated in the barrel which means that when the probe comes forward uh, which I'll show you in a minute it hits the lead balls and then the whole thing basically locks up very precariously as it's halfway through the firing cycle and then it's prone to unpredictably fire at any point as you try to unjam it. Uh, not only is that very inconvenient and very dangerous, it's also going to deform the lead ball which will affect accuracy and it also has the potential to bend or even break the relatively flimsy probe. Now whether this system would have worked better 80 years ago when this was new and being used with period ammunition I don't know, uh, possibly but probably not. Um, from my point of view at least it seems like a fundamentally flawed loading and repeating system by the nature of its design. Um, I have found another considerably easier and safer method to load the gun but whilst it is relatively quick it does bypass the repeating function. So how I'm now shooting this gun is before I cock it I'm basically muzzle loading it. So I'm putting the lead ball in the end of the muzzle um, and then using a makeshift ramrod to push it down as far as it will go and then cock the gun ready for firing. Now I will load it and do some shooting later in the video but I'm going to keep it unloaded whilst I'm still handling it. This is a spring piston air rifle and as you can tell from the big bolt handle sticking out the side it is a bolt action gun. Now bolt actions aren't very common on spring guns and they're predominantly found on military training rifles of this era as they were trying to replicate the military service rifles of the time which were uh, largely bolt action. Now the Mars 86 has a particularly interesting cocking system even when compared to other bolt action air rifles so I think it's worth having a look in more detail. So with the exception of a select group of pistols including the Webley Senior which has the barrel uh, above the compression chamber and therefore has a different direction of travel of the piston. Uh, just about all spring piston guns um, the piston is pulled backwards to compress the spring before being released forward when you pull the trigger. Now I still have the VZ47 out here so when I pull the bolt handle back there is a lot of resistance and that is because um, the bolt is drawing back the piston which is then compressing the spring towards the back of the compression chamber until it's locked in place by the sear um, and that is the exact principle, uh, exact same principle as on um, any kind of brake barrel or underlever. Comparing that to the Mars 86, once I unlock the bolt there is no resistance to pull the bolt back, it moves freely back and forward. But once I pull it far enough back to lock the piston on the sear the spring is then compressed by the bolt handle being pushed back forwards. Um, because of that it means that the spring is kept compressed prior to firing, not by the piston being held by the sear, but the bolt handle being turned and locked into position. Now as a result of this, unlike most spring guns, it can be decocked. And to do this, you just bring the bolt handle back to take the pressure off the spring, and then you pull the trigger to drop the sear, and release the piston. Now obviously you don't want to do it too much to put unnecessary wear on a gun this old and rare but as you can decock it there is something quite satisfying about just being able to rack the action and the bolt back and forwards. Now because of the interesting way it works it's relatively simple to take apart as unlike most spring guns there's no pre-compression on the spring. Um, but technically there is, but not in the conventional way. And you'll see what I mean, uh, because I think it's worth taking apart to look at the interesting internals. To disassemble it, you first need to remove the two small screws in the front of the uh, end cap. Uh, you then need to pull out the fake cleaning rod which is tapered to give it a tight fit and then pull that band off and with that nose cap off the only thing left holding the action into the stock is this one screw uh, in the main cylinder or compression chamber Undo that, I can very carefully 
take that out to stop me losing the trigger spring which is then just loose inside then the oops, screw up uh, end cap safety and trigger are all just held in with this one pin um, and that's nice and easy to drive out with a punch as there's no spring pressure on it. That pin out. I then just need to gently tap the end cap off. I can now just slide out the bolt, piston and spring assembly. So as you can see this is all one self-contained unit and it's a somewhat unusual design especially with that probe sticking out the front. Now as you can see there's a relatively small uh, mainspring inside there. Uh, it's clearly not going to produce a lot of power but this was a cadet rifle, it didn't need a lot of power and it couldn't have been uh, too powerful as it would have been too difficult for children to operate. Um, there is some pre-compression in it but it is secured in place by these pins. To cock the gun you pull the bolt handle back until the bottom of the piston catches on the sear like that. Then when you push the bolt handle forward the collar, this bit which it's connected to uh, then slides over the other part of the piston to compress the spring like so. Um, in most spring piston guns as I said the spring stays compressed by the piston catching on the sear but because this has already happened here the spring is kept compressed by the bolt handle being turned down into this slot here. So the other interesting thing about this design is in relation to the probe at the front of the piston. Now when the sear drops uh, the piston um, shoots forward and this probe then goes into the back of the barrel behind the pellet. Now there are two possible reasons for this design and I'm not sure uh, which one is correct, uh, it could be both. The first, on the face of it, the more obvious explanation is that it gives it an initial extra push to get the pellet moving quickly. But what is, in my opinion, the most likely reason is revealed by looking at the end of the piston itself. So as you can see, there are three holes in the end of it. Now when the piston travels forward, because the transfer port at the back of the barrel is essentially blocked by this probe, um, as the air compresses, it's forced into these three holes, which is then diverted in here and comes back out and out the end of the probe. Now whilst this admittedly seems complicated, there is a point to it. Uh, when the probe is all the way forward, it is past the uh, cutouts in the barrel for the pellets to drop into. So effectively, uh, the end of the probe is the transfer port, meaning that the air starts from a couple of inches into the barrel. So none of the air is lost out of those cutouts and into the magazine around the barrel, which would result in a massive loss of power. I put the rifle back together off camera to save time. So moving on to look at the rest of the gun. The trigger, as you would expect, is single stage and non-adjustable um, and the trigger spring, uh, as you saw earlier, is not even actually connected to the trigger assembly. It just sits in a cutout in the stock and is kept in place by the sear lever when the action is screwed into the stock. Now, whilst it is a basic trigger, it's not too bad to use and it is quite nice and solid with it being a milled piece of steel rather than a thin stamped piece has a manual safety uh, at the back of the action here. It's a wing style safety, uh, unsurprisingly very similar to the Mauser Car 98K, which was the standard issue rifle of the German army at the time. So when it is to the left like this, it's on fire. Um, and then when it is moved over to the right, it's on safe and you can't pull the trigger. And the way that safety works is there's a barrel inside that rotates when you move this, uh, the actual catch over. Uh, in one side of it there's a cutout that allows the sear to pivot up into it um, and on the other side there isn't so the sear is blocked from dropping. Looking at the sights, the front sight is what appears to be just a very short post 
but in fact that should have a bead on top of it that's obviously been broken off at some point and that sight is screwed in so I assume that's so it can be adjusted for elevation and it has a small flat surface on either side so that it um, is easy to hold to adjust. It has a period uh, military style rear sight and that's held in place with a dovetail so that it can be tapped one way or another to adjust it for windage and then it has a stop screw in the middle so it can be tightened to stop it moving its dovetail. Now in its standard setting like this you can use it um, just with its kind of uh, battle sight notch at the back like that with elevation being provided by the front sight or you can however flip up the rear sight and use it with this sliding notch for greater distances which on a small low powered rifle like this is completely pointless but again was that put on there for practicality or to resemble a military service rifle. I don't know how well you can see here but the rear sight is range marked with graduations up to nine. Uh, I'm assuming that's in meters and as was the style and technology of the time there is no facility to mount a scope. Now with the exception of the range markings on the rear sight Mars 86 on the top of the compression chamber here is the only marking anywhere on the gun although some Mars 86 uh, 86s were marked with Venus Waffenwerk uh, Zellemelis Germany on the left hand side underneath the slot for the bolt handle. Um, because the gun isn't serial numbered uh, I couldn't even begin to guess how many of these were made. Now I'm now going to test the accuracy and power of the Mars 86. Uh, before I do though I should state that in practical terms this is largely pointless. It's an 80 year old gun with a small mainspring, broken front sight, slight bent rear sight and I'm using modern ammunition which I'm technically loading incorrectly. So I'm not going to be poring over the results wondering how I can improve its performance. Uh, it's a collector's item not a, com a competition winning match rifle. Um, the reason I'm still testing the accuracy and power is because I like to keep a record of each of my guns. So first of all, the accuracy. I'm going to fire 10 pellets or 10 of lead balls, which are these 8.08 grain CZ number 9 4.4 millimeter balls at one of these 14 centimeter square targets at a distance of just over 10 meters. Here I have my target. Now there are only actually nine holes in it, so I don't know where that other shot went. Uh, there's one hit on the white background, but the other eight uh, all went within the uh, scoring rings. And from this particular gun, I'm not gonna complain about that. I'm now gonna test the power by putting another 10 of those CZ number nine lead balls uh, over the chronograph. Here I have my chronograph test sheet. Now I've already done all of my calculations. And with those 8.08 .08 grain CZ number nine lead balls, I got an average velocity of 199.65 feet per second with a spread of 42.2 feet per second. At the highest being 211 feet per second and the lowest being 168.8 feet per second. So using that average of 199.65 feet per second, that gives me a very low power of just 0.72 foot pounds. But as I said, it is what it is, and for this rifle it really doesn't matter. So there you've seen the Mars 86 Cadet Training Air Rifle. Now I really like this gun, as I love bolt action air rifles and military training air rifles. Uh, in fact, military trainers is the only specific category of air gun that I actively collect, and that's because I think looking into the history behind them is fascinating. 
Now, I realise that there may be a negative connotation to this gun, given its association with Nazi Germany, and therefore it might not be for everyone, but it undeniably has historical interest. And my aim in documenting it in a video like this is to try and preserve history, especially as the Model 86 is supposedly one of the rarer Mars training rifles, and therefore there's very little documentation on it. I have a pretty good air gun reference library, but the only book I have which describes or even mentions the Mars 86 is the Blue Book of Air Guns here, and even that uh, incorrectly refers to it as the 85. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's an error. I'm almost 100% sure there's no such thing as a Mars 85, and both the information and the picture uh, do describe and refer to what's actually the 86. Because of their scarcity, especially here in the UK, they don't come up for sale very often, so it's hard to put a value on the Mars 86. Now this one I paid slightly more than I was hoping to, although still within what I was willing to pay for it. Um, I bought it at auction and all in I paid just under £400, and that's including the buyer's premium and all the other fees. Uh, the actual hammer price was lower than that. Now I suspect that that may be slightly over the market value, but I wanted it for my collection. Now this specific example isn't in too bad overall condition given its age uh, and as you've seen it is still in shootable condition so I will shoot it uh, just very sparingly uh, due to a number of factors such as uh, the age, lack of spare parts, availability of ammunition and general practicality. Uh, this isn't going to be something I'm going to be shooting every day. Um, it's definitely more of a collector's item. So thanks for watching, I hope you found the video interesting and if so be sure to like, comment and subscribe to the Air Armoury and until next time, keep your arms in the air.